Welcome to the History of European Theatre podcast, and thanks for joining me on this journey through millennia of theatrical history. Episode 114, From the English Renaissance to Shakespeare and Johnson. Hello, I'm back. I hope all has been well for you while I've been away and your own adventures in theatre have continued. Speaking from a UK perspective, and I think this is true for many other places in the world too, theatre is having a tough time at the moment, battling with the re-establishing of audiences after the Covid pandemic, rising costs, reduced subsidies and an undervaluing of the economic benefits of the theatre sector by politicians. I try to keep politics out of this podcast, at least none that are less than at least 400 years old, but it does feel that we are at a turning point in the UK for both commercial and subsidised theatre, and the struggle for survival has never been harder. As we move towards a general election in the UK, there has been some political interest in the subject lately, most notably a debate in the House of Lords, the upper chamber of the UK Parliament, where some strong arguments for the soft and hard benefits of the arts sector were laid out. Let's hope that the right people are listening and some change can be effected. One thing that I've certainly learned when looking at the history of theatre is that it always survives, however bleak things look. I have no doubt that theatre in some form will be around in the years to come, but much of value might be lost along the way, and many people with great talent may be denied opportunities in the sector, and that worries me. But theatre people are by nature optimistic, and there is always hope. Engaging and thought-provoking theatre is still around, so please do make the most of it and support it when you can. And with that, I'll get off the soapbox. Welcome to Season 5, Shakespeare and Johnson. In the opening episodes of the previous seasons of the podcast, I've usually had to fill a gap. Those centuries between the visibility of Greek theatre and the first itinerant steps of Roman theatre, then there was the equally opaque period between the fall of Rome and the emergence of recorded medieval theatre, and then the changes brought about by the early Renaissance in continental Europe. The leap from there to the English Renaissance was perhaps not so great, mostly one of geography rather than of time, But I did, nevertheless, move to a theatre that was uniquely distinctive and, of course, highly influential on the future of global theatre right up to today. But on this occasion, the title of this episode is, I must admit, a bit of a stretch. In the last season, we were already in the period that produced Shakespeare and Johnson. And if you're just jumping in at this point, although this is by no means essential, but I would encourage you to go back and listen to season five before continuing here, because it should give you a really good idea of the theatrical world of the Elizabethan and Jacobean periods, including the birth of the public theatres and the development of acting styles and something close to a profession of being an actor or a player, as they would have said at the time. This is the world that Shakespeare and Johnson helped to create. In truth, there is no great leap between seasons here, but a continuation, and the season break is very much artificial. However, I can't deny that Shakespeare and Johnson deserve this specific attention, and I deliberately avoided dealing with them in the previous season, along with the many other playwrights and actors of the period, because, quite obviously, there is much more to say about them both. In fact, in the grand plan, this season can be seen as part two of a trilogy, following a very strong vein of literary and cinematic traditions, because, after Shakespeare and Johnson, I will still have to deal with the other major playwrights of the Jacobean period – Webster, Middleton, Massinger, Beaumont and the others – taking us through to the English Civil War and the closure of theatres in 1642. If you've been with me for a while, you will already have noticed that there is a lot of leakage of subjects between these three seasons, as it seems inappropriate and unwise to cut off a particular story just because it cuts over the somewhat arbitrary divisions of time that we retrospectively ascribe to historical periods, especially if they are just there for the convenience of the podcaster. But I must not get ahead of myself too much. The later Jacobeans and their revenge tragedies and satiric comedies are for another day. For now, I just wanted to emphasise that this is a beginning of sorts – but mostly a point of continuation. From Sackville and Norton, through Green, Marlowe and Nash, and then Shakespeare and Johnson, to Webster and Middleton and the others. From Gorbiduck, 
to Tamburlaine and Faustus, the Spanish tragedy, the alchemist, many, many Shakespeare plays, and on to the white devil, tis pity she's a whore, and many others. You're no doubt asking why Shakespeare and Johnson. Surely Shakespeare deserves a season devoted to him alone. One could, of course, produce multiple seasons just on Shakespeare and his plays, given the vast number of volumes that have been written about him over the centuries and the many, many productions of his plays. My reasons for combining them are twofold. I wanted to emphasise that Shakespeare was not the standalone playwright of the time that he is sometimes seen as today. Now he stands head and shoulders above his fellow playwrights, but this was not always the case. Shakespeare and Johnson were at times friends, and at times sort of rivals. But Johnson was probably the more popular and successful playwright in his time. It was he who broke new ground by publishing a collected folio of his plays and poems. This was an unprecedented move at the time, and was a publication that perhaps inspired Hemmings and Condell to publish their posthumous folio of the complete Shakespeare plays. It was Johnson who dominated court entertainments, if we take his many mask entertainments as well as plays into account, and the public playhouses resounded to the audience appreciation of his plays, particularly his comedies, at least as much as they did for Shakespeare and possibly more so. However, it is undeniable that Johnson's plays have not survived as well as Shakespeare's. You probably only know one or two Johnson plays at most. And the reasons for that are certainly matters that I'll be looking at during the season. My second reason for the Shakespeare and Johnson combination is that I also wanted to have someone to compare and contrast the Shakespeare life story and plays to as part of the narrative of the podcast, and Johnson is the obvious candidate for this, being one of the most prolific, popular and long-lived of the playwrights of the period, not to mention the personal relationship that the two men had. Johnson's life story is an interesting and entertaining one, and thankfully we know much more about his activities on and off stage than we do of Shakespeare's. The life of Johnson is undoubtedly worthy of telling in its own right. Johnson will, I think, be a useful counterweight to the dominance of Shakespeare, and a good reminder that there was much to enjoy in Elizabethan and Jacobean theatre in addition to Shakespeare himself. In fact, Johnson is a tricky character to get hold of. A good deal of what we know about him comes from himself or from the first-hand accounts of people he knew. Great, we might think. That sounds like a great deal more fact than we have ever had before. But Johnson seemed to want to construct a public persona that was different from his real personality, and at times it's pretty difficult to pick the two apart. The lack of information about Shakespeare allows us to speculate and suggest all sorts of possibilities for him whereas Johnson poses much harder questions to answer just because we seem to know more about him, but cannot be sure how far we trust what has been said. Inevitably, there is a question as to how to approach Shakespeare. There are thousands of books on Shakespeare, from hundreds, maybe thousands, of scholars, some of whom have spent a lifetime studying the 38 plays and the life. A quick Google book search on academic works on Hamlet alone returns over 500 suggestions. Even allowing for winnowing out the less than relevant results, that's still an awful lot of words about one play, even if it is, as it is in some estimations, the greatest tragedy ever written. So, I'm well aware I have a challenge on my hands, and I am by comparison to many of these authors supremely underqualified to comment. All that I can give you is a personal view, based on my reading of the texts and the commentary that I can absorb in the time given. Any errors and omissions are of my own making. I will focus on more recent scholarship, both published works and the academic papers that I have access to, and will inevitably be editing and summarising quite considerably. Will I cover all of Shakespeare's plays? Yes, at least I hope so. I think every one of them has something interesting to say or that we can extrapolate from it. And it is certainly my ambition to look at the complete set as we have it, as well as whatever can be gleaned about those that are now lost to us or considered part of the Shakespeare apocrypha. What I'm not planning to do is to summarise the plots of plays in quite the way that I have done for the Greeks and the Romans and others that I've covered so far. 
Mostly, this is because I think it's safe to assume that you don't need an outline of the plot of, say, Hamlet or Romeo and Juliet or A Midsummer Night's Dream, and it would not be productive exercise for either of us. That may not be quite the case for some of the less well-known plays, perhaps for Timon of Athens or Pericles or Henry VIII, for which I expect I will do some plot exposition. In either scenario, I'll certainly be discussing the plot points and filling in details as I think necessary. If you do need a plot summary where I don't cover it, then there are plenty of summaries available on YouTube and on the internet generally for free to differing levels of detail and quality. I feel sure that you can find those for yourself as you feel necessary. I also plan, with some trepidation, to discuss the who wrote Shakespeare's plays question. I say with trepidation, as I'm well aware that this question generates some very strong feelings for some people. Whether the bard was Francis Bacon, the Earl of Oxford, Christopher Marlowe, the Earl of Rutland or William of Stratford, or some other person, is something of a sideshow as far as I'm concerned. The existence of the plays is, I would say, far more important than the question of exactly who wrote them. But I am aware that many people do think it's an important question, and it does at least say something about the way we create and then review, maybe even rewrite, history, and why these questions arose in the first place. Although I can absolutely guarantee that I will not come up with a definitive answer to the question, I think it is worth devoting some time to it and exploring it carefully. All this will come in good time, towards the end of what I anticipate to be a long season. Inevitably, there will be some repetition of events, plays and playwrights that I've covered before, particularly in Season 5. My plan is to refer to these in the detail required at the time, but not to repeat all of the detail that I covered before. Where necessary, I'll refer you back to the relevant episode in case you need a refresher. And speaking of refreshers, for the rest of this episode, I'm going to remind you of where we have come from to get to this point. Just the main points to get you and I back into the zone. By the 1520s and the 1530s, with the energetic son of the Tudor dynasty on the throne, England was poised to become a prime mover in European politics and culture for the first time. Henry VIII's reign would cause more upheaval than anyone could have imagined as he ascended to the throne, but for his earlier years at least, he was seen as a cultured, thoughtful and ambitious king. He would never lose that ambition, But his image as a man of letters and appreciator of art became overshadowed by his moves on the church, his obsession with regaining lost French lands, and of course, his habits of divorcing and occasionally beheading his wives. At the time, poetry to be read aloud was the dominant form of literature, with poets of high social status like Sir Philip Sidney producing work of the very highest calibre. Compared to this, theatre was a lowly art, hardly an art at all in the view of many. Plays were performed by troops of actors who were seen as little better than thieves and beggars, and were concerned with either the retelling of religious and biblical stories, moral tales that personified sins and virtues in a seemingly never-ending battle for the soul of men, or low comedy and acrobatic and musical entertainments which have not survived in the record. What changed, slowly through the Tudor period, to make theatre a dominant form of entertainment was a combination of factors, some of which were unique to England. A prime factor in this, in my view, was the increase in levels of education in the population. Although it was far from universal, education became available to a greater number of boys than ever before. Those in the middle of society, the sons of merchants and guildsmen, and not just the sons of the upper classes, could go to one of the newly established grammar schools in their local town so named because their primary focus was on learning Latin grammar, and skills that would enable them to join the burgeoning ranks of the civil administrators that were becoming required as the population grew, or to join the ranks of the clerics who were also required in large numbers. Some of these young men went on to the new universities, and the Tudor monarchs did get their administrators and their priests, but they also produced men who had learned the skills of debating, and discovered the classical texts that were used for teaching Greek, Latin and rhetorical skills, but also presented them with a pre-Christian view of the world and the power of dramatic art. London played a central role in theatre development, 
And in fact, throughout the period, we primarily talk about London theatre because this is where most of our information comes from. Outside of the capital city, theatre was mostly restricted to travelling troops playing in local halls or the grand rooms of the local gentry. In some cities, medieval traditions of the mystery or cycle plays continued. But those petered out through the latter part of Henry's reign, with few being active by the time Elizabeth ascended to the throne. The change in religious practice, first under Henry and then his successors, was the major catalyst in the demise of the cycle play. London was in a very special situation because of its centre as a trading hub of the country and its relatively large population. The city had gained many concessions from the Crown, which meant that it was in some respects self-governing and could allow or deny activities as its mayor and aldermen saw fit. Performed theatre with what could be considered permanent homes started in London in several inns. These were places that had always welcomed travelling players and which now accommodated resident troops for at least part of the year. The first public permanent playhouse was built just outside the city in 1576, although it's possible that a theatre at a farmhouse called the Red Lion was operating a little before the theatre was opened. The Red Lion was a little too far out of town to succeed, and plagued with some legal difficulties concerning its construction. As things turned out, legal issues often followed the theatre builders, which was no doubt painful for them, but it does give us much of the information that we have about the nature of theatre buildings at the time. The theatre was built by James Burbage, father to Richard, who would become one of the greatest actors of his generation, and was probably the first purpose-built theatre in England since Roman times. The project seems to have been plagued by a lack of funding from its earliest stages, but we should probably see Burbage and his partners as entrepreneurs who saw a developing trend, a gap in the entertainment's market that was on the edge of what was legal, and who were always on the edge of failure. But succeed they did, and there are a few records of which troops performed at the theatre, but in the end their legal difficulties became too great, and in a bold move Burbage and his sons dismantled the theatre and rebuilt it in a different location as the Globe, on land that they had acquired at Bankside, near the well-established Rose Theatre. The area just outside the city walls in the south of London and across the Thames had become London's theatre land. Theatre in London quickly became a very popular entertainment for the public, so much so that through Elizabeth's reign, the Privy Council, the Mayor and his aldermen and the bishops were moved to issue reprimands, orders and laws concerning the theatres. Those in charge had an inherent fear of the gathered crowd outside of their direct control. Southwark was a shady sort of place, frequented by entertainers, hawkers, prostitutes and all sorts of low-life characters. The cockfighting, bear-baiting and gambling that took place in the pleasure gardens alongside the theatres, and sometimes sharing the same buildings, attracted all sorts. But there was no denying that the steady stream of people who walked across London Bridge or paid the ferryman to row them across the Thames, from the higher-born to the most lowly who could afford the penny entrance fee to the theatre, went there to be entertained and, I would venture, educated. In an age where literacy was a long way from universal, people were still steeped in traditions of oral storytelling and performers who possessed prodigious skills of memory. The open-air theatres depended on natural light, so performances were usually in the afternoon, and the audience had to put up with the summer heat, the winter cold, and of course, plenty of unpredictable English rain. The time was also one of plague. Regular recurrences of the pestilence decimated the population of the city and the country and forced the closures of theatres on the grounds of public health. That was, at times, a genuinely held fear, but probably, at times, also used as a tool to curb gatherings that could become problematic. Recurrences of the plague forced the actors who had become resident in the city to return to touring the country. We have clear records from Edward Allen and his troop that indicate how difficult that could be. There was one occasion when his troop had to pawn their costumes to fund their return to London. In a time when movement around the country was already quite restricted, we can only imagine how locked down the country was in the time of plague. But it seems that the plague did have a positive effect. We will hear more of this in coming episodes, but it seems that the enforced halt to the churn of writing plays for London 
was the catalyst for Shakespeare to produce some of his finest works. The actors, in close collaboration with the theatre managers, were at the forefront of innovations in the theatre. Broadly speaking, they morphed in a short time from travelling performers working in what we can assume were smaller venues, where they performed mystery and morality plays, or interludes as entertainments between banquet courses for lords and ladies in the local manor, into performers for a mass audience on the large London stages. The acting style probably became much broader, maybe even bombastic, to accommodate the larger spaces and relied on character types and costumes used as indicator of character. Not that this was something entirely new, and it's important to remember that these actors had worked in the morality and mystery play genre, where costume was symbolic and settings were often timeless and geographically uncertain. Tudor and Stuart theatre was theatre of the word and the imagination, a style that combined much that had been seen before of those earlier styles, and their audiences probably understood these conventions very well. Actors were frequently called to act at court and continued to work as entertainers for the gentry in their homes. There were also indoor theatres, which were invaluable as a venue for year-round theatre, but they had their own fights to stay open. Players were clearly very versatile and had to learn how to adapt their performances to these different spaces. And great actors emerged. Burbage and Allen for tragedy and history, Tarleton and Kemp for comedy were the most notable, but there were others whose names and parts are recorded in manuscript, quarto and folio versions of plays. More and better printed versions would have been nice for us, but at the time, theatre was still an ephemeral art, and printing of plays for their own sake was only just becoming a commercial proposition that printers were willing to take a risk on. Actors worked under the patronage system that allowed them more freedom of movement than was afforded to most. Where an aristocrat maintained a troop of actors, they were technically his household servants, and could travel under his permission and perform as guests at other stately homes and, more significantly, within the City of London. Leicester's men were one of the earliest formal troops, and others soon followed, culminating in the troops like the Lord Admiral's men, the Queen's men, and, most famously thanks to their Shakespeare associations, the King's men. Some of these aristocratic sponsors were friends in very high places, and they were useful to the players at times, offering them degrees of protection from others who saw acting and the playhouses as dangerous things but it also meant that players could become embroiled in political matters and the power games of the individual members of the Privy Council. Players and theatre managers certainly had to be astute political players, which was all part of the arena that they operated in. The legal records, laws and edicts passed, Privy Council instructions issued and then clarified, and correspondence between the Crown and the Mayor and the Aldermen of London and the Bishops provide a lot of the information that we have about how theatres operated, but it doesn't always provide the clarity that one might expect from legal documents. There is always a question of who is behind the instruction and what circumstance were they reacting to, even before questions of exactly what the language means in a legal sense are asked. We have to tread carefully, but, nevertheless, they are amongst the best-preserved records and invaluable. And finally, we come to the playwrights themselves. Of many, we know very little apart from some of their work. Figures like Robert Greene and Thomas Nash remain vague in the record, but as a group we can identify a significant number who emerged from the universities and the inns of court. Both institutions of higher education produced a share of playwrights. The curriculums focused on Latin and developing skills of rhetoric, both of which involved study of Roman and some Greek texts recently rediscovered in the early Renaissance. Plays written in a Senecan style, like Gorboduc, were written and performed at the inns of court, and reflected that teaching. Gorboduc is of rather stilted and formal poetry, and the influence of debating skills is clear. Even Christopher Marlowe's early work is static and poetic rather than dramatic. But there was much more to Marlowe than just his university education, and he remains one of the most fascinating characters of the period. But he was part of the university set who lived and worked in London. Indeed, he has become something of the poster boy for it.
the impression is of a boisterous, if not a dangerous, life. Marlowe's early death may have had more sinister reasons than the youthful brawl that it's sometimes been portrayed as, but this is an age when a fight in a tavern could easily have fatal consequences. Ben Jonson had his own scrapes with violence, which we'll get to in detail later, and Shakespeare seems to have been conspicuous in managing to avoid such eventful encounters. But we must remember Marlowe for his mighty line, his grasping of the poetic iambic pentameter that enabled plays to be both poetic and dramatic. After Marlowe and Kidd's Spanish tragedy, plays could work on a physical as well as a cerebral level. This was the form that men of creative genius, and yes, I mean Shakespeare and Johnson, could take to levels that had not been achieved before, levels that would appeal to all, from the groundlings to the Queen. Amongst the playwrights, collaboration was the order of the day. Henslow's diary indicates a lot of payments going to multiple authors for the same work, some as co-writers and some for others to polish an unsatisfactory script. Inspiration came from existing stories, many taken from Italian sources, pamphlets of recently published real-life crime stories, previously performed plays and the histories of the country. If there had been a concept of copyright at the time, the legal system would have been filled with claims and counterclaims. Some of that inspiration was little more than copying with added flourish. But there was no copyright, and there are some indications that copying previous works was taken as a form of flattery rather than offence. Either way, the playwrights had to work hard for the income they received. Being paid only for the delivery of a script and having no financial interest in its afterlife. The prolific authors fed the insatiable thirst of the playhouses for new and recycled work. But the players who became very wealthy were those who owned a share of the playhouse. It was certainly a time when a good profit could be made in the theatre, enough so that actor sharers like Shakespeare, Phillips, Burbage, Condell, and Allen would all become very wealthy men. They, surely, did not doubt the theatre was worth all the strife that it caused them. So, I hope that brief summary has served as a useful reminder of the vibrant, exciting, thoughtful and, yes, dangerous period that we're about to step back into. There is much I didn't include here, but all of the past episodes are still available if you feel the need for further reminder about anything I missed. As I've mentioned before, this is a period where we get some wonderful detail to discuss, despite the many gaps that we cannot fill. I feel sure that we are in for a very interesting time. As I was thinking about this season and looked back over the previous episodes, I was reminded that my initial thought about this podcast was to help understanding of the plays and the theatrical styles in general by putting them and their creators into historical context. More than ever in this season, I'm going to try to stick to that as my central purpose. Through the reading that I've done so far, I have been constantly reminded that although we tend to see Shakespeare as a playwright who speaks to all times, as he wrote the plays, he was just a jobbing playwright talking to and commenting on his own times. We may not recognise or understand it all now, but the plays are peppered with references to and comment on current events, that many in his audience would have understood. That Shakespeare managed to make his plays universal and appealing to future audiences and times is absolutely part of his genius. And the question of how conscious he was of his skills is a central conundrum for anybody who studies his work. Both Johnson and Shakespeare were working within the political and the artistic confines of their day much of which I've already investigated in the previous seasons, mainly in season five, but also in the earlier seasons, because although the English theatre was a distinct development, there were influences from the continent that I covered in season four and from the medieval theatre that I discussed in season three. And that isn't to mention the obvious influences of Ovid and Plautus and Terence and the other writers and philosophers of the ancient periods of Greece and Rome. In tandem with this season, I also plan to produce a series on the historiography of Shakespeare criticism for the subscribers on Patreon. After the production of the first folio shortly after Shakespeare's death, his reputation didn't pick up immediately, and the journey of how people thought of Shakespeare, from jobbing playwright 
to literary icon, is one that takes many dips and turns along the way. With the three episodes I produced on the production of the first folio, I covered some of the effect that the fetishization of that volume had, but there is more to tell on that front and on the reception and understanding of Shakespeare in general. So, if you're interested in that aspect of Shakespeare and the development of his reputation, please follow the links in the show notes or on the website to patreon.com and subscribe there for a small monthly fee. All the income generated through those extra episodes goes towards offsetting the costs of hosting the podcast and the website and my research costs, and it's invaluable to enabling me to continue with the podcast, so your support is very gratefully received. In addition to the upcoming new episodes, you also get instant access to all the existing Patreon episodes, which cover many aspects of theatre history and occasionally some more personal blogging from me too. For those of you who already subscribe on Patreon, I'll shortly be restarting memberships and will be contacting you soon about that. Next time, I'm going to kick things off with an episode devoted to establishing a timeline framework for Shakespeare. As I already mentioned, over the last season we encountered Shakespeare at odd times, as a contrast to the other playwrights I was discussing, or when he collaborated with them. But now, I think a timeline that focuses just on Shakespeare will be a useful framework for what is to come in detail later. There are many uncertainties with the dates of Shakespeare's life and with the plays, but I'll do my best to guide you through those and give a clearer view as possible. That's in the main narrative for season six, but just before that, I'm going to slip in a return to ancient Greek theatre for a look at a play that I didn't cover in season one, including A God and a Slave as a comic double act and a bunch of green reptiles. In the meantime, please join the Facebook group or page or find the podcast on Instagram or X just to keep up to date with new episodes and other theatre related stuff. I have been very quiet on the social media outlets while the podcast has been on hiatus, but I'll be returning to them soon to make regular updates. You can find details of all of this on the podcast website, which is www.thehistoryofeuropeantheatre.com. It's great to be back and I look forward to your company next time. But if you do have any comments or concerns in the meantime, you can contact me by email at thoetp at gmail.com or via x at thoetp. <laughs>